Uh, good afternoon, folks. We appreciate you joining us today. This is Ed Walsh with NACA. And uh, I think we've got a great topic for this, the webinar this afternoon. And I truly appreciate our presenters, uh, Jason and Alex's time. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. My job here is to kind of facilitate the, uh, the webinar, some of the background stuff. But we just, for those folks that are guests, we uh, know you're probably hearing this for the first time. So just want to run through a couple of things real quick. Uh, during the course of the presentation, you'll see polling questions come up. Uh, if you're uh, going to be asking for CPE, you absolutely must uh, answer those questions, and you also must remain on the uh, webinar for no less than 50 minutes. So um, please make sure you do those things. Uh, you're going to be muted during the session. Uh, if you raise your hand, we're going to try to field questions, but um, it's sometimes difficult to, to field all the questions. So. What we ask is that you type them into the questions function on that little box on your screen, and uh, we'll fit them in. We'll, I'll read them to uh, presenters uh, and fit them in as quickly as we can. Um, after the presentation, the slide deck is available if one is used, which it is. Uh, the recording will be posted on the NACA website. Uh, if you do experience audio issues, which has happened in the past, we, uh, while using your computer, we, uh, we suggest you you'd call in instead. Um, and then I'll ask somebody uh, to just go to the question box and let us know that we're coming through okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch over the screen to Justin. And we thank our gentleman from Grant Thornton today. Uh, sharing. Okay, if you gentlemen can introduce yourselves. Perfect. Thanks, Ed. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, glad you're able to call in here a couple of days after Valentine's Day on an afternoon. Um, my name's Alex Colts of Justin. If we just want to kind of go to the next slide where we have some old mug shots of us. Um, we're both with Grant Thornton. Grant Thornton is a public accounting firm, um, and we also do quite a bit of consulting as part of that. Um, as part of what we do as GT uh, is also a lot of real estate and construction work where we work with owners, with general contractors, with investors, um, really anybody that's involved in the construction process, um, REITs as well. And we apply our audit, forensic accounting, investigative approach, process improvement, controls, kind of the typical things that um, unites us all as NACA members. Um, and continues our continuing education. And we thought that it'd be a really good idea to do something a little bit different. That's not usually within the scope of audit today, um, but something that we've had quite a bit of experience on recently, both for owners and for contractors, because of everything that's been going on with COVID supply chain um, issues over the past couple of years as really a lessons learned. Um, this deck is going to be available. We'll try not to read it and try to give you some examples and make it a, a, a lively discussion. Um, please do jump in with any questions in the question box or chat, as Ed mentioned. We're also going to try to end 10 or 15 minutes early so that we can do a little bit of back and forth. And finally, on the last slide, um, there's a link to an article that we co-authored a couple of months ago on this very topic that will provide a little bit more substance um, in addition to this presentation. So thank you for joining. Um, Justin, if you want to give a quick overview and then we'll get into it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alex and Ed. Thanks for, <coughs> for having us. Um, yeah, Justin Levin, audit manager at Grant Thornton, um, and spent a lot of the last 10 to 12 years of my career really focused on, um, on construction auditing, um, whether it's uh, owner direct, uh, in, a, in a wide range of industries, really just trying to be part of a successful project. Uh, and then more recently, um, since rejoining Grant Thornton, getting more involved on the on the, the construction manager, the contractor side. Um, similar themes, but uh, obviously looking uh, out for from their perspective. So look forward to providing some insight into our recent experiences, as Alex said, with the, the changing uh, with the current market conditions. I think there's some things that hopefully everybody here can take away one thing from this presentation and bring it back to your your respective organization that's right thank you 
Um, so a little bit of an agenda here. We're going to go through just a little history of construction material costs, right? Because this whole topic is managing material escalation. Um, going to really kind of describe, right? Depending on what side of the aisle you sit on all the time, or if you're in the consulting world, hop around depending on the client, um, how things change for owners versus contractors and some of the key factors that we've learned to be really important. And then we're going to walk through really how we coined it three scenarios. Um, depending on at what stage of a project is um, and whether a claim is ongoing, like actively, um, if a project's going on but there's no claim and how you can ma manage that a little bit. And then what everybody always wants to do is apply all these good lessons learned for future projects. Um, the, con the, the, the material escalation claim process is usually one that does involve attorneys, right? This is kind of my disclaimer and qualifier, just because there's legal and contractual interpretations. Um, although we work with attorneys, we're not attorneys ourselves. Um, so if there is legal interpretations, like the disclaimers always go work with your in-house or outside counsel to get any information, but we're gonna be sharing you our experience and our guidance and recommendations, again, based from a auditing, financial, um, expert witness type of mindset with, that deals with construction projects. So I just wanted to make sure that's clear because whenever we hear the word damage, don't want to conflate the important role that attorneys play and then the important roles that financial um, financial analysts play as well. So if we move on to the next slide, um, we're going to start this off with a poll, right? Uh, please submit these questions um, as part of the CPE process. So I'm just gonna read it out loud and then Ed, you let me know when we have an appropriate amount of answers. So by how many percentage points did the PPI, oh, my screen changed a little bit. So let me read the question. Did the PPI of iron and steel increase between January, 2020 and June, 2021? So about a 18 month period, less than five, 15, 30, or greater than 50%. I, uh... I found out something about GoToWebinar. They don't allow you to use certain symbols in the answers. So I, ho I hope I got these this right um, when I redid it. Because you, uh, you had the symbols, but uh, they wouldn't let me use them. Got it. Got it. Good to know for the next time. You got it right on this yeah. one. Yeah. OK, good. All right, we're almost at 90% voted. You don't have to vote if you don't if you're not Getting CPE, you don't have to vote, but um, okay. Giving it about a minute, we're going to close that out. I don't uh, know if you gentlemen can can you read yep, that. Yeah, I see the answers. Yep, we got three percent for less than five percent. Uh, approximately fifteen and thirty got between twenty-five and forty-four percent. And greater than 50 is is a third. So kind of all over the place, right? From 15, 30, and 50 uh, percent. And in reality, the answer is D, greater than 50 percent. And it's really oh. even closer to like 80 percent. Um, and all of that is due to what I said at the start of the hour around the different material price uh, factors that cause things to skyrocket. Um, and what happened is, and if we kind of go to the next slide. What happened is I think this chart will summarize it really well is if you go uh, and look at this graph this is PPI construction material we limited it just to four years um, but I'll tell you what if you look towards the left tail right and you got to go back to the 90s and even the 80s it's going to be the same answer where the construction material pricing didn't really change for a really long time right contractors and owners generally knew what steel and wood and conduit and everything that they need for a project generally what it costs right it was a very strong supply chain the gray bar here uh, as we all lived through in 2020 that's covid and then we see about six to eight to nine months later this huge spike right and this is on an index basis so we basically see prices doubling right towards 2022 and then a little bit of evening out now in current state. And this is really relevant because fundamentally, when material escalation comes an issue, is when a contractor submits a bid using, let's say, 2019 pricing, 
And then when the contractor is buying the material in 2021 for a long-term project, they're saying, uh-oh, my bid is nowhere near what the actual pricing is going to be, and I'm going to be underwater really quickly, right? And we see that, we saw that quite a bit over the past couple of years just because of the, the veracity of how fast the pricing changed across the board and the up and down and everybody's trying to manage and not stop work and there's supply chain chokeholds all over the place. And this really causes a lot of these material escalation claims to really come down the pike, as you can imagine. Now, the other piece that I'll say, kind of bringing it now, right? If we look at um, the far right side of the graph, which is a little bit of a decrease, right? We see us peak kind of right before July, the summer of 2020. And now as we get to current state, it's going down a little bit. Um, one of the things that, you know, a couple of our clients are worried about is for new projects, our contractors now, our owner clients, our contractors now going to get a potential windfall because now they're using prices today, right? But if prices fall significantly, then obviously when they make those purchasing decisions, they're going to have a nice profit margin from what their bid estimate was to what they actually purchased. My response typically to that is nobody knows the future, right? We don't know what's going to happen on a global basis or if there's going to be some kind of a shortage in one price and in one material category versus the other. So it's really hard to kind of think about it that way. But that volatility does increase the recommendation to have more transparency from your material suppliers and from your contractors so that everybody's on the same page of how much things are costing and how you can manage that as part of just the construction the building relationship so the answer to the question was more than 50 percent and this chart signifies kind of what happened historically and we want to make sure that we use everything that's happened over the last couple of years and hopefully learn from it in our roles so that we can advise our clients appropriately moving forward Justin, if you can go to the next page. We lost Justin. We lost Justin. He said enough is I'm enough. <laughs> um, well, let His me. His picture. Is... Anybody have any well, questions? He... This would be a great time for people to uh, submit some <laughs> questions that we can talk about. I can pull it up on my screen here, assuming he doesn't come back for whatever reason he just sent me a text and said his power went out he's in philly hopefully nothing bad okay. has gone on in philly um give me one okay. second please have you alex have you got the um the presentation on your computer on your screen i, I sure do let me just like figure out how to share my screen well no no hold on let me let me uh do what i have to do first okay let me text Justin. Right, to make you, sure he's all right. You should be getting a, a a little thing on your screen that says, "Do you want to share it?" Okay. So, show my screen. Yeah. Do you guys see? Nothing yet. Press the button for show my screen. I'm usually pretty good at this stuff. Uh, somebody says that they, they can see it. I can't. Okay, maybe it's my problem. You can see okay, it. Okay, there it is. There, there it is. Okay. All right. You're on slide you're on slide one. I'm I'm working back to it. Yeah. Uh, All right. There you go. Well that's fine. There hopefully Justin uh hopefully Justin's able to return. Uh <laughs> that's funny. Um I'll let I'll keep you guys posted on my text messaging with him on whether or not uh, he's okay, but he said his power went out. Okay, so getting back to the show, uh, we talked about construction construction material increases, right, leads to escalation. So now we're going to go to our second poll here, and simple question, is the owner always responsible for material escalation claims? And Fed, if you can put that up on the screen, we'll go through a similar yep. process. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, we got uh, 60% have voted. Eighty. Give it another ten seconds. All right. See those results. Alex, can you see the results? I can't see the results now that I'm sharing my screen. No, if you could narrate them to me, that'd be great. Uh, I can, yeah, I can see yeah. the results. Sorry, I can see okay. it's Justin. So, uh, okay. oh. Justin, what happened? I think I had a whole power outage here, so I had to go flip the breaker. I apologize. That's how um, it happens. Three <laughs> percent for um, the owner. Uh, is the owner always responsible? Three percent, yes. 18% no, and then 79% it depends on the contract and what the contractor did to minimize the cost. Right. right. Yes. Um, kind of a trick question or a layup, however you want to look at it. Um, probably a little poorly worded, but yeah, like in most things, it's never black and white. Um, it does depend on the contract structure, what happened operationally. Um, and a lot of different factors. And those are the, exactly the types of things that we're gonna walk you through now. So I'm not sure if I'm still sharing my screen or not, because my screen, it looks like it's, uh, it's, it's on Alex. You want me to switch you back to Justin? If you could switch it back to Justin, that'd be great. Give me one second. We were talking before this that Ed's done about 250 of these and they always go really smoothly and we never have any issues. So I'm glad that we yeah. were able to be memorable uh, on your 251st. Yeah, it's just something about Philly this year. I don't know. I'm just glad that Justin decided to attend this after the heartbreaking uh, game from the other night. Um, he's been He's been in, down in the dumps, that's for sure. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, kind of on the heels of the question, who's responsible? We put together this table, right? It's not exhaustive, it's not all inclusive, but it is, I think, directionally what we want to get across. And we've broken it up into who owns the risk, owner versus contractor, and three kind of factors, right? The contract type, right? The mechanism for delivering the work, um, contract clauses, and what's in there and what's not in there. And then finally, the operational factors. So I just want to walk through um, really at a high level. And this isn't absolutes, right? There's carve outs and there's exceptions for all these. But generally, here's how this works. So the owner, if it's a cost plus contract without a GMP, right, right, meaning that there's no maximum amount that the contractor has agreed to, they're usually going to be at risk when it comes to escalation because the contractor is purely submitting their cost to them. It costs the contractor more, the owner pays more. Same type of situation in design build, um, where there's really the design part is happening um, while they're building. So because of that lack of certainty, usually it's gonna be the owner that's gonna carry the risk. On the flip side, um, I think we can all understand that a lump sum is, you know, you get what you bargain for if you're the contractor, right? You're probably going to incorporate some contingency. You're probably going to incorporate some fat in your bid. But at the end of the day, if you say that you're going to build a hospital for $100 million as a lump sum, you better build a hospital for $100 million as a lump sum. And this obviously extends to the subcontractors, which most of the costs are at. And then cost plus with the GMP is a similar type of concept, right? Um, it's a little bit less risk for the contractor because there is that cost plus element of it. But since there's a cap, once you hit that cap, that's when contractors start to ask for escalation via change orders or claims. And that's when uh, owners typically push back. On the contract clause, we you know, merged these cells and made sure to make it clear that uh, both owner and contractor will carry this risk. If there's nothing describing how escalation is gonna be uh, handled, in the contract terms and conditions, 
and both sides aren't going to be in a great spot because they don't have a piece of paper to point to and say, hey, here's what we agreed to back in the day when we were going through the contract phase. Um, depending on relationships and a whole bunch of other factors, maybe it gets worked out uh, equitably for both sides, um, or maybe the attorneys and other project executives take it in a different in a different direction. So not a great situation when there's nothing that even addresses the allowability of escalation. The second part is um, sometimes we see in contracts that escalation is allowed or not, right? Um, unless there's certain force majeure or other types of scenarios, delays, things like that that happen. But then it doesn't really define a process for how to map and validate escalation, right? So it's high level. It says escalation will be considered, period. And then the parties are left to figure out uh, when the time comes, what portions and what components of escalation are gonna be included, if it's for the whole time frame, how it's gonna be supported, if there's any cost sharing uh, for escalation. And again, that's just gonna cause risk and uncertainty for both sides, which is gonna then bleed into the project execution, the timeline and other issues. So you wanna to try to avoid that. And then finally, I mentioned force majeure. If there's something that just says force majeure, but doesn't really address the details on what those you know, acts of God could be, um, that could be subject to dispute. We know we went through a lot of that at COVID, obviously a once in a lifetime touch wood event. Um, but if it doesn't really define whether or not escalation is associated with all the force majeure and what that really means, that could be a, a subject to dispute. And then from a project operational factors, right, kind of going through again, if there's contingency on a project, right, um, sometimes contingency can be used for anything, right, if, it, if the contractor holds it and even if the owner holds it, um, sometimes not, right, sometimes it's just used for uh, kind of specific items. And what we're seeing is if contingency doesn't have a definition for material escalation, We've seen a couple owners push back on it and basically say, hey, I'm not getting any more building or a better product or a faster timeline, right? I don't wanna use my contingency for uh, escalation of materials. Um, and in that point, the owner's kind of saying, well, I guess I'm gonna carry the risk, but I don't like it because then contingency is just this big bucket of money. Um, so there's some risk, honestly, for both sides, but a little bit more to the owner. Um, Design changes are always tough to parse out, right? When you have design change orders and bulletins and things that might need changing because then fundamentally the contractor is gonna say, well, I needed to go back and I needed to purchase more material or you told me different material, my means and methods changed, my timelines got adjusted, which affected my purchasing. So there's more kind of risk on the owner when there's significant design changes, which is why the design build contract mechanism is subject to uh, to some risk there. And on the contractor side, what, I, what we mean by purchasing behavior is once escalation is known, right, or it should be known uh, to the contractor, right, or the subs that are making the purchases, um, what are they doing to mitigate that, cons mitigate that cost, right? Do they have visibility into identifying that hey, I assumed that Condit was gonna be $3 a foot and now all of a sudden it's 450 and I gotta buy a ton of this stuff. Like, how am I gonna deal with that? And how am I gonna communicate and report that up to the owner to maybe think about some alternate resolutions to mitigate that cost, as opposed to just assuming that the owner is gonna cover it, right? You kind of do things in the status quo manner in a, a unique situation that might come back to bite contractors. And then the supply chain delay limitations is having a stable of suppliers or vendors that you can tap into is really important. Um, supply chain resiliency is really important. And obviously the last couple of years that we saw when that broke down for not just the construction industry, but everything else. Um, if you only have one or two con uh, material suppliers that you go to, right? That's the only partnership that you have. You're only deals that you can make that might be problematic because you're not getting put to the top of the line or you're not able to secure the material that you need so operationally the contractor would carry that risk um, so again just a little bit of a snapshot of who owns the risk it's like anything in construction 
it's going to be case specific project specific contract specific relationships matter the type of project matters um, money matters but this is a little bit of a snapshot of how we, how we view escalation risk on the owner and contractor side so justin i'm going to pass it to you yeah great thanks uh thanks Alex. Any questions before we get in and add before we kind of get into the different scenarios? None as yet. Okay, thank you. Great. So, you know, as I think as we've started this presentation, we've talked about um, the current, you know, uh, commodity market and pricing, and we've also talked about risk. So what we're going to do for the next couple of slides is just introduce a couple of different scenarios and how, you know, the escalation claim can be managed and it, it could be no matter what kind of role you play within your organization hopefully there's some things that could be considered um and examples that we would expect especially from a construction audit perspective and if your role is a construction auditor kind of things you can consider when it, uh, either depending on the situation a claim is being submitted so in this first example you know the construction manager submits a material escalation claim um, and there really isn't a strong or any escalation or a claim language within the contract so so really what we want to focus on is there's two um there's two factors right two two factors you have qualitative elements and you have quantitative elements uh within this claim that's being submitted on the left side of this graphic um are really the the considerations what considerations went into this claim and we'll start really on the qualitative side and then the right of the graphic are examples so things that were considered factors elements considerations that went into um each of those different considerations on the qualitative side so and a lot of this may be stuff that you know we, we alex introduced in the previous slide but that first consideration is what mitigation efforts did occur right what between the project stakeholders your owner your your construction manager uh your your subcontractors overall project stakeholders what mitigation efforts did occur was there conversation about buyout savings to potentially offset some the the price increment the incremental price increases when the project was ultimately bid to where ultimately when the material was being purchased? Uh, and, and Alex introduced contractor contingency, another funding source that could potentially be used to offset some of those increased prices that may be borne by the contractor and potentially pass through to the owner. Uh, another example would be an alternate supplier or vendor. So were those considerations? Is there an opportunity to go to go out and competitively bid potentially a supplier or a vendor to get additional pricing components that may be less and then less than the potential exposure as it relates to the escalation? And then on the, the second kind of qualitative consideration is what support was being provided. Again, we want to make sure that the claim that's being submitted is really on the actual material costs, right? And, and not really any other productivity or other indirect type of stuff. So, you know, what that actual material cost was initially bid for and then what it was actually purchased for and being really specific as we can as it relates to the material that's being that's been impacted by the increases in the in the commodity market and then what relevant data or pricing data is being provided so is it invoices is it contracted rates is it audited rates what what data is being provided to support that claim it shouldn't just be some productivity factor or or indicator that's being used across a large segment of material and then lastly, on the qualitative piece, and maybe just as much as, as important on both sides is what isn't being included, right? Uh, this isn't an area, This the claim that's being submitted isn't intended to be uh, additional profit for the contractor. So the removal of overhead and profit, and then you know where, where are we drawing the line with change orders, right? If change orders are being priced at more of a current market condition, those should be removed from the claim that's being submitted. So just again, those are the qualitative pieces or the qualitative elements in a situation where claims being submitted and there may not be the strongest contractual language. Yep. On the quantitative side, again, so the quantitative elements of that is now the actual mapping of estimated to actual cost. That would be the first kind of quantitative element. Again, what the project was bid for, what the initial estimate included, how that was supported, and then where the actual prices are. And I'm gonna kind of skip down to the third line because this kind of applies that we should be as direct as we can with items. So it's not so much just trying to take a basket of items and taking a factor against them. 
where we can be with direct items, whether it's struts, cables, uh, iron and steel, and not just putting everything into a, a large number and using some factor, where we can get actual pricing against initial and estimate, that's how understanding the mapping between estimate and actual cost. In the middle, middle swim lane um, is the next quantitative element, and that is what consideration was considered during the initial estimate of standard escalation. You know, usual business practice, there should be some element of escalation included. You know, that contractor should be aware that pricing, the pricing environment isn't as stable or traditionally may not be just stable and flat. So is there a one to three or 5% inclusion within the initial estimate? Therefore, the, the impact on the submitted claim really should be the net of wherever the, the current uh, increase percentages on escalation as compared to what was potentially included in the initial estimate. And then, and then lastly, on the, the quantitative element is avoiding generalizations, and I sort of already addressed it, but if we're not able to produce documentation that supports, you know, initial estimate and mapping it to actual, or there's a pocket of material um, that may be grouped together, it's, it's really in the best interest not to use like a CPI index. There's enough data out there that specific indexes, and we produce the PPI for construction material, but they, there are PPI data for specific material that you can use those factors. So where there's the where there is indirects or a pocket of material that's grouped together, being as specific with indices as possible is certainly the best approach rather than using a broad, such as a consumer price index, when trying to price the escalation. Yeah, the only thing I'll kind of, you know, load up on, and I think Justin did a nice job covering it, it's the first, you know, bullet here on this screen, is it's really important to isolate what was estimated, the quantities against what was actually bought. Um, we've seen companies uh, run into issues by incorporating other factors that might have been impacted, right, whether it was productivity and they want to kind of include that in the escalation bucket of materials, or there's a change in means and methods, and they're saying, well, my bid changed from how I actually performed the work, which then opens up a whole other can of worms. So the best case scenario, right, and, and hell, it's hard to figure that out because um, you're never planning for a claim right on the front end when you're doing the bids and when you're putting together, um, when you're actually doing the work and then putting together all this kind of administrative stuff, usually on the back end. But the biggest thing to try and isolate and what we can do is to help whether it's owners to validate a claim or supporting contractors to submit a claim is how specific can you get and how transparent can you make that cost so that it makes it a no-brainer that you say hey mr owner you approved um, this cost at four bucks a foot and now when i purchased it it was six dollars a foot like that is what it is, right? It was things that we couldn't control and how are we supposed to manage it? And then you can have some really good discussions, but being as specific as possible um, is really, really important. Yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately the goal, and I think this goes for either on the owner side or the contractor side is really to produce, a, you know, a reasonable claim that's based on accuracy, transparency, and is it intended to be additional revenue or a revenue windfall for that contractor that may have poorly priced or went in low on the bid. So I think on both sides, it's really just about accuracy, transparency, and reasonableness when it comes to uh, submitting or, or evaluating a claim, no matter what role you play within your, within your organization. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to our third and uh, final poll. Um, so I'll just read it for the group group here. Um, these three factors are indicative of an effective claim. One, it isolates the increased material prices against the bid estimates used during the award. It is supported with detailed bid versus actual purchasing data. Three, it describes the proactive mitigation efforts undertaken by the contractor. True or false? Uh, you know what? I think I messed up. I, I was not able to get the true or false into that answer. So um, if uh, if you just go ahead and, and uh, pick your pick your answer and and you get credit for uh, having answered the poll, 
Uh, we did have a question come in while uh, you were talking. I'll, I'll read it now and then we'll get right into the, uh, I'll launch the poll. Um, uh, are you currently allowing labor inefficiencies in your calculations with clients? Not for material escalation, right? Um, there might be other claims if you need labor inefficiencies or there needs to be some catch up for acceleration due to those labor inefficiencies, but there needs to be almost a separate track and separate analysis to be performed on the, the number of you know, estimated uh, manpower, um, what was assumed to be completed in kind of a best case scenario and just a really separate analysis on the labor productivity. So that's something that clients are um, trying to get from the contractor side. Owners are hesitant um, to kind of buy into that argument. But as for the topic at hand here on material escalation, it shouldn't be, right? If you're just asking for material escalation, it's really just a bottom line impact to the contractor that says just isolated to material, what is the impact? And it should be outside of any other factors that may increase the cost to the contractor. So it's a good question. And it's kind of a two part answer of, yes, that's obviously coming up or has come up over the past couple of years, but it should not be included as part of just a solely material escalation claim. <clears throat> we had a couple of the attendees uh, tell us that their answer to poll question number three was true. Yes, all three of these uh, are accurate, so I appreciate that we got a even distribution on this one. Good. And for whatever it's worth, it looks like 40% actually picked number two, so I guess if there's a level of importance or maybe a takeaway from what we've talked about, um, supporting the detailed bid with versus actual purchasing data seems to be a uh, maybe a, a takeaway that the group's gotten so far. Okay, um, moving along. So we talked about sort of uh, scenarios. So we talked about where a claim was submitted, uh, maybe without um, the strongest of, of of contractual language. And a scenario two is more, and I would say that was probably more reactive. Um, the scenarios, the second scenario gets into ongoing construction uh, where there's a likelihood due to the volatility. So almost even in our current markets conditions right now. And this is maybe more of the proactive piece. Um, so really what what proactive things can be happening uh, that would potentially mitigate um, the likelihood of escalation claim or minimize the potential exposure? Um, so again, so how can we proactively manage material escalation claim? Uh, so again, I'm not going to kind of read all of them. And I think some of these we've actually touched before we got into the scenario. Um, but Again, good practice from a project management perspective, you know, monitoring, having those ongoing monitor, uh, monitoring of the initial, the original cost versus where the market's going and the current cost that subcontractors or contractors are, are having. That just goes into continuous communication, being open about it, there's the transparency. Um, maybe there's the ability to go into some advanced purchasing, um, potentially if with owner approval, maybe the contractor buys product or material that satisfies multiple of their projects uh, that may require some off-site storage that the owner has to incur but there could be some advantages where you're getting you're removing that risk of commodity prices and the volatility of them by doing some advanced price, uh, purchasing that the contractor can do with owner approval on the flip side um, maybe some uh, the owner uh, furnished and contractor installed uh, where that owner is purchasing that material uh, where the, the contractor installs it uh, could be an opportunity to, again, again, all of these are just intended to where can we reduce risk, impact, um, exposure on, on a material escalation claim. And then as the project is going, you know, I know value engineering may be something that happens in the beginning of the project, but if, you, if you're value engineering it throughout the life of it, is there an opportunity to potentially substitute material, uh, potentially scope change, a design change that would allow that would allow the project to again to kind of pivot uh, or to avoid um, some potential uh, material escalation certainly in a, in, a, in a market where there seems to be some pricing volatility and 
And then our, our third area and kind of the bringing it all together is the project hasn't even begun or there's the opportunity to, to make changes within the contract um, and certain things that can be discussed and included into a material escalation clause. Again, um, not any legal advice, just things that we've seen in the industry of where, what can be included in a solid and sound material escalation clause and what sort of elements that it can include to make sure that all sides are protected. So describing triggering events that may uh, be happening in the market or something that triggers it where the escalation clause. So is there gonna be a delay in the project which may trigger some material price uh, over a certain percentage? Um, again, there should be some level of, of threshold where uh, the project may absorb the first five, 10, or maybe even 20% of material change, but above that, they're going to be subject to escalation. Again, we're going to provide just some examples that are out there in the industry where that would be part of a negotiation where owner and contractor can decide that over a certain percentage, then that's where there's potentially uh, an escalation claim could be submitted. But within that threshold, it's going to be absorbed within the project. Um, the other opportunity is, you know, material allowances, right? Could there be a material, an allowance for material escalation built into the contract, built into the schedule of values that can be, that can offset some of those um, known unknowns uh, that happen throughout the project. And then again, I'm the, the second to last bullet really about mitigation efforts. You know, what what should be in play? What can be written into the contract clause that we've talked about in previous slides um, that could be done as far as uh, owner buying it, uh, contingency usage, uh, buyout savings, all those things potentially could be written into your contract clause that could address and really put a sound material escalation clause into the contract. And then just a few um, Examples and again, these will. This hey, is sorry, Jeff. So. Can you go back one slide. I just had one Absolutely. comment to me. I was on mute. Yep. The, I think an interesting one that I recently just saw on a contract is the second bullet, where it kind of provides that threshold of escalation that's already baked in to a bid, whether it's at the subcontractor level and you know typically at the subcontractor level, or whether it's MEP or otherwise. And what they did is they said that we're going to review the costs for material every six months. And they use the PPI for that specific, um, or they use one of their vendor quotes because it's you know good data. They said if the vendor quote is more than 6%, then they're going to have a discussion around escalation. And I thought that was a really good way to, you know, I like your phrase, known unknowns um, of saying, hey, we're not really sure what's going to happen. Right, let's have that baked in already in the contract that allows us to have that discussion. Right, and then they had a slew of bullet points in terms of how that would actually be put in force. Um, but it just kind of lays it out to remind people that, hey, six months is up. Let's go back to what we initially thought that uh, you know, pipe was going to be. Let's look at it now. If it's within 6%, then that's assumed that that was already baked into the bid as kind of that standard escalation. If not, then you have a discussion. So I thought that was a really good way of doing it. And I think maybe uh, dovetails into some of the two examples that we're providing uh, all of you in terms of some high level contract language. Yeah, the, um, you know, currently, at least from what I can see, the AI hasn't really put any escalation clause language out there. Consensus doc has some, um, the second, the second, uh, section here is around how allowances allowance language it can be included from an escalation piece so again just some opportunities or potential examples of what can be included if 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 your if your project or your role has some input into uh the development or the review of construction contracts you know obviously it's going to be important that the, the force majeure clause isn't going to be strong enough by itself um to, to make sure that their escalation clause is in there that um, are getting granular enough so that no surprises. And again, going back to the goal of accuracy, reasonableness, transparency around the claim um, so that, you know, there's not the, the fight and the litigation at the back end. And again, just another example. Um, 
this one actually brings in not only the percent, but there's also a day component as well. So you get a dollar at a time. And again, this is all going to be available. I believe these slides are going to be available. So um, this can be as a, as a takeaway. Yep, they're actually, uh, they can download it from the uh, webinar under um, handouts. Wonderful. Um, I'll just kind of, a Alex, I know you, you had mentioned this is the, um, the QR code, the, the Q reader. Uh, as, as Alex said, the, we, Grant Thornton and the construction team, kind of all third a, an article, a uh, white paper on managing material escalation. Again, a lot from real, um, real world situations dealing with uh, contractors and owners and, and really just trying to be that uh, evaluator to make sure that the, the claim was sound and kind of poking holes and evaluating uh, what the components that went into submitting that or what will be submitted. Thanks, Justin. And that's it. Um, 45 minutes as promised. Ed, any other questions come through um, while we were yeah, we doing our thing? Yeah, we had several come in. Um, starting from the top, um, how do you obtain a bid estimate from subcontractors who competitively, who competitively bid in our lump sum? Thank you. Well, what we would say is, again, depending on what side of the aisle that you're on, but the GC should really be responsible for getting enough detail that the owner requires for them to kind of approve that subcontractor. Right, and it might vary on the size of the contract or other factors, but owners should include in their prime contract that for any procurement at the subcontractor level, they're going to provide that level of detail. So even if ultimately it's lump summed, that doesn't mean that a subcontractor, <clears throat> excuse me, subcontractor just submits, hey, it's gonna be 2 million bucks for my scope, right? There's still some kind of a detailed buildup that we recommend <clears throat> is provided and then ultimately a decision can be made to lump sum it right and look at it on a either milestone milestone or percent complete basis but it's really important on the front end that the owner clarifies to the gc what their expectation is so you can start to see it and then if the discussion starts to go is okay we know it's lump summed at the subcontractor level right Typically that means escalation or any other costs, right, are out the window. But again, depending on the relationship, depending on if the subcontractor says, well, fine, I'm just gonna walk off the job. If you're not gonna pay for me, I'm not gonna take that risk, like things changed. Then you kind of put that to the side, the lump sum nature of it. And then you say, okay, show me, right? It's not ideal because subcontractors can pull whatever they want theoretically at that time, but show me how you develop that bid in more detail and then why your prices are, are different. So I would say best class is the owner needs to really dictate what kind of transparency you get. And we're hoping that with all these challenges over the past couple of years on this issue and, and others, owners are just, owners and contractors align a little bit more on what they need from their subs. Uh, another question, uh, have you seen a significant increase in subcontractors going into bankruptcy because the project cannot absorb the increase in the last six to 12 months? Um, none of the contractors on the jobs that we work with, but granted we work on usually some pretty large jobs where there's a good amount of whitelisting that goes on kind of due diligence before um, owners are approving subcontractors, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, I just recently saw some data that bankruptcy is, is up over the last couple months. I think Construction Dive last week, I think had a really good article that a GC, or I'm sorry, a subcontractor down in Florida went bankrupt for this very issue, uh, meaning they had a fixed fee price contract, prices were all over the board, they couldn't manage it, the owner wasn't working with them, and they went belly up. So I think it's definitely happening. I think it's not just limited to um construction meaning bankruptcy right we had a lot of free money that was given out during the pandemic interest rates were obviously what they were things are different now um stimulus money isn't coming through so i think just everybody's going to be feeling that pain a little bit um but i don't have any direct knowledge of subcontractors that are going out of business but again we deal with larger projects typically justin i don't know if you have any more to add on that piece 
No, no, I think you covered it again. I, again, I, I have not seen it. And to your point, these are large, these are large contractors. Um, but um, there's also, you get some of the bonding and if, if that were to happen, you, you know, if there's a bond out there, you know, there's some, some proactive things and some things preventative nature that would still keep the project going and be able to get it complete. Uh, another question is, uh, if contract uh, has been executed, but job is, hasn't started, and negotiations occur without an agreement upon resolution, is the next step going out for an RFP starting all over? Um, I'm not sure I followed the question in the entirety, but I'm going to say what I think the question is, and then uh, if not, may, maybe add it in the chat again. Um, so a contract signed, and then things are uncertain, and you want to basically say, we need a modification to the contract price or how things are done. Um, I would say that's a part for a change order, right? It can be a change order to add in terms and conditions. It could be a change order to increase contingency. It could be a change order to go back and include some allowance, right? Um, I think the most important part is that communication between the owner and the contractor to talk through it. Um, I don't think that a reasonable thing to do would be to scrap everything that's been done and kind of put it out to bid again. But if the sides aren't willing to move forward at the pricing, right, there's probably going to be some legal action for non-performance. Right. If I'm the owner and I already awarded something and somebody signed on the dotted line saying I'm going to have substantial completion in 12 months for 30 million dollars. And then they say no, um, that could lead to just other dispute areas. But I think a more reasonable again, if I'm answering the intended question, the more reasonable is how do you paper kind of contractually what's going to happen through a change order, right? A contract amendment if needed. And then how do you figure out how that cost is going to be shared? And I think just one, uh, just one thing that Al, that Alex hit on that was part of our, you know, part of those proactive measures that I don't think we really discussed was the change order process and making sure that contractually there's good contractual verbiage on that change order process because it may get into that field of when you're going to have those conversations post award and if that change order language from a process perspective is sound, you may be able to address it through that as well without scrapping everything. I agree with Alex. Said. Uh, last question we've got is uh, any guidance on if an allowance was included with the set amount but the actual escalation exceeds the allowance yeah that's tough right I mean because ideally you set that allowance where it's gonna be um, you know enough you want to you don't want it to be too high right if you're the owner because then obviously the contractor is motivated to spend it arguably um, but if you do run out and it's supported, I think natural discussion then is, can we use contingency funds, right? Or do we have to get some new money from a change order to account for that? Um, there could be a situation in, in that where I think the owner could, could say no, right? Because that was probably negotiated on the front end to have that allowance for that known unknown concept. Um, if I'm advising the owner, I'm saying, listen, they thought about it. They had the opportunity to put in the allowance amount that was going to cover them um, and they didn't do a good job bidding it uh, or didn't do a good job in their estimating function even with the unknowns so I would probably take a little bit of a stronger stance especially if this was happening now just based on the volatility but I think another um, resolution would just to get some new new money or draw down from contingency. Justin any other yeah. thoughts on kind of how to manage yeah. that? I was going to take maybe the other side if I'm the kind put my contractor's hat on potentially and even the owner, but if there's other allowance monies, right? So we're buyout savings and we kind of talked about it a little bit on some of the other the other areas of mitigation, right? But if you've got allowances for crane operation or winter weather or whatever it may be, and you've got allowance monies that are still available, I think you could argue that you could just transfer some of some funding sources and other allowances to cover maybe an overrun on on material escalation. And again, the other area that wasn't mentioned was maybe buyout savings. Again, if if buyout savings is being held at a separate uh, line item and not all moved to construction contingency, potentially there's an opportunity to use to use internal funding sources to cover that those costs above that allowance. 
another question. Uh, if the owner has builder's risk insurance, does escalation, I guess, assume, uh, get covered by uh, force majeure? I'm not an insurance expert. I know we've had some insurance, uh, construction insurance guys that have done really good presentations in the past. My understanding is that builder's risk would not cover a material escalation piece as part of like their allowable uh, claim categories. So I'm just going to leave it at that, but also a plug for all the great uh, construction insurance uh, experts and attorneys that are part of NACA. Maybe reach out to them. I'm sure Ed, you have some of their contacts to maybe have a deeper discussion. But I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't believe so. Okay. Well, that looks like the questions for now. Anyone else? Okay. Well, we are coming up on the top of the hour. So, uh, without any further questions, I'll say thank you for uh, gentlemen, uh, uh, Justin and uh, Alex for giving us your time and expertise today. It's much appreciated. I appreciate you folks that sat in to the presentation, even with our little hiccups in the course of it today. Um, and uh, we hope you come back to the next uh, webinar when we, we get one scheduled. So with, uh-oh, oh, okay, those aren't questions. Uh, just thank yous for, for joining us from some of the attendees. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and say once again, thank you all for, for being with us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.